right. What's up, everybody? It's the Emergency Podcast. Dee, 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 dee. Uh, it's JD Bunkus. It's Sam McKee. And, you know, Sam, you just rushed home from Real Kipper and Born. Mm-hmm. I did the worst thing today, which is the hour long podcast that gets disintegrated an hour later. And I called it, man. I said on the show that. This reeked of Friday news dump one oh, way yeah. or the other, right? A long weekend. You've been around this business long enough. You knew it was coming, but luckily we have this podcast. So thank you to those of you that subscribe to it because you got hit with it in the feed. Thank you to those of you that watch on YouTube. We appreciate you. So you just rushed home mm-hmm. and you just asked me before we jumped on, is this going to be a Gree talk? And I don't <laughs> know because I, I didn't listen to your show because I didn't want to be tainted by anything that you and Kipper talked about. Mm -hmm. And I also wondered if you kind of had evolving thoughts. I got to tell you, like from my first standpoint, and if you're watching this, listening to this, whatever. Yeah. Kyle Dubas is no longer Maple Leafs GM. Mm -hmm. They haven't announced a new GM, but we saw Brendan Shanahan take to the podium today and deliver. Let's just start with that. What, what did you think of the Shanahan address? Cause I think this is where we might disagree to start. Well, first of all, I had a tough time getting a word in today with Kipper. I like if you got to go back and listen to Kipper today. I like he put on an absolute show. Oh, I knew it was, it was his day. It was it was elite sports yeah. talk radio. The man yeah. delivered. So if you get a chance, go listen to the Real Kipper Unborn podcast. Gord Stellick was in today. He was great too. It's an excellent radio show. One of the best days of my career, honestly. It was just crazy. And, and go listen crazy. and subscribe to JD Bunkus podcast. Oh, yeah. Talk and- about how what, people might get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Go well. Actually, there's some interesting tidbits in there about Matthews's future yeah. without Kyle Dubas, which yeah. we talked about, and like who could be candidates. So, but yeah, just do it I, because you know I worked hard on it, and it's you know it was it was it was a tough day for me. Anyway, sorry, keep I, going, bud. I that one is in the Hall of Fame, like yeah. it's an all timer. I you could tell the second he sat down and started talking, it was pretty clear the tone, his body language that he was open book Shanny in that. How long did he talk for off the top there? 11, 12 minutes of him just laying out what seemed to be a very believable and normal sort of timeline with no details added to kind of spin a nail. Like I I thought it seemed very genuine Mm -hmm. and I was just so shocked like many within leaf nation, how, open he was i did not expect him to be that forthcoming with details and like if we're talking about narratives and talking about winning in the court of public opinion he put on an absolute show in spinning the narrative today regardless of what happened like the way that he went out and said what he said today it was a master class in putting the side of the public perception on you right like it was okay. incredible so this might be a bit of a Gree talk because, all right, we're people. The, the number one show on television right now is Succession, mm-hmm. where Roman Roy goes down and tells the talking heads what to say. And I got to say that I feel a little bit like that right now with just like, you, you know, like, all right, here we go. Shanahan, he did it. And <laughs> do this, the guy, you know, I, I feel who's totally liking stuck <laughs> in this, right? Like people land in that joke and I'm going, I could see how you would feel this way. Yeah. But let me just say this to start. One is when people are going, there's two sides to the story, people with Dubas and Shanahan. It's like, okay, but yeah, we only have the one side right now. And two, and, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, how could you watch that and think there's some kind of massive spin zone going on there from him? Agreed. Like, you think that Brendan Shanahan went up there with this beautifully calculated game plan? I actually, I got to tell you, Man, again, I sound I know I sound like the 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 guy from Succession part of what's their network called? APN. ATN. ATN. I feel yeah. like ATN where I'm just like Shanahan was so good. <laughs> waste waste our Royco. Waste our Royco <laughs> boy check it in here. But I was pretty shocked by the level of transparency and I went, if you're a fan of a team, that's what you want. Mm-hmm. Like you want your general manager just got fired and people thought a couple of days ago that he was likely coming back. This is the guy who has been tied to this core. He's been the face of a lot of fans for the last five years. And the president of this team, who I don't think, by the way, is uh, free of any responsibility in all this. And like, we'll get to some of his complicity of where he screwed up too. But I just went, yeah, he walked you through the steps day by day, his thinking, 
and you don't have to agree with him, but the fact that he actually laid it out there pretty raw, I thought was kind of commendable in the era of secrecy of sports organizations where they don't let anybody in. I thought, yeah, man, if I'm a fan of this team, I, I feel like I learned something today, which is pretty rare in this era. So I, I thought you're especially, right. Well, just especially, well. especially coming off the fourth straight locker cleanout day mm -hmm. where uh, outside of obviously Kyle Dubas, what he said on Monday, which boy, and Ryan O'Reilly. Yeah, and Ryan O'Reilly. And, you know, well, no, I should. It's Marner and Matthews. That's basically who I'm getting at here. Marner, Matthews, and Nylander, yeah. who all, and sorry, and Tavares, who said he yeah. played great off the puck, yeah. and he was really proud of the way that he played. Well, that was great. You could have yeah. plugged and played yeah. any of the last four playoff heartbreak locker cleanouts this year, and it would have been the same thing. So to have, you know, the president of the team come on with that honesty after what we saw on locker cleanout from some of the main principles involved with the yet another playoff failure, mm -hmm. it's, it was so stark. Like that's why mm -hmm. I think everybody was so shocked because nobody like Kipper kind of called it saying he might expect some openness. I, I did not see it coming. Like it was a really, really wild thing to see when you put it up against what else we've seen from this team in terms of being closed books as opposed to open. Dude. And it's funny because when Lou came in, Everyone talked about Dubas being a bit of a Lou disciple and Dubas mm -hmm. would actually give the odd soundbite where you would go, Oh man. And Sheldon Keefe obviously would have his slip ups because he was an emotional guy. Yeah. I couldn't help but wonder with Shanahan, like if that's where the disconnect with him and Dubas was at times with Shanahan being a former hockey player who's won mm -hmm. and who could tell that there were these moments with this Leafs core where he would come out like Shanahan's the one that brought up killer instinct, right? Mm -hmm. Shanahan's the one that, when these losses happen, like game three, I guarantee you he's not sitting there going, oh, yeah, the puck luck, right? <laughs> it's bothering him. Yes. It's bothering him deeply. And I wondered if the disconnect with him and Dubas was about that. And for him, when he saw Kyle go up there and deliver the speech of him not really sure that he wanted to be there, I wonder if he just looked at it all, stepped back and said, you know what? This, like, this has to change. This attitude that this organization has had of, guys who like being here, but don't need to be here, you know, who won't do anything possible to be here. This is going to start at the top and this is where we're going to start to change things. That being said, this is where I get critical of Shanahan. Mm -hmm. If you're going to offer Kyle Dubas an extension at the deadline and you're going to stand up there and say about how common this is. And it's just like a player when it's clearly nothing like a player, like nothing no. like a not player. That was, of course not. That was nonsensical. What yeah. he said in that part of it. Man, if he was your guy, then you should have made him the guy at the beginning of the year. Like, if you could understand Kyle Dubas at the deadline versus Kyle Dubas before the year started, this shouldn't have been a question. You should have gotten it done before the year started. You should have figured out the extension. You guys should have been on the same page. You should have never let it get to this point. But the fact that it already was there and that Kyle Dubas did get tenured an offer, decided to turn it down, like, this is the part I'm, I'm losing it with people who are in the Dubasite camp where they just yeah. refuse to give him any blame. Like how much time do you think the guy should have? Yeah. He got offered a contract extension month, like March. Yeah. It's May. He had all this time to sit on and think about it. It was sitting on his desk. They told him what he wanted was going to get. And people are like, he negotiated for more money and for more power. And some of the reports that are out there was like, he was asking for maybe two, 3 million a season more than what they were offering him. And he wanted more power from Shanahan and people are acting like it's crazy that MLSE just because they have money and that Brendan Shanahan, because he has power, wouldn't just want to capitulate all those things to Kyle Dubas after one playoff round over five seasons. Like he had time. He was yeah. given an opportunity and that's he went out and he, he negotiated in the media and his boss saw it and didn't like it. Like that's business, baby. Yeah, no, you're right. And that's honestly, that part of it to me is he got caught. He just got yeah. caught. He got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. And like, how long, like you said, how long do you expect to get? It's a major market where it's the number one sport in the market. It's the most, maybe the most popular team, not maybe the most popular team in the country where it's the favorite sport of the country. It's the biggest mm -hmm. job you can have. And like, yeah, sure. You know, you can talk about whatever you want with him and some of the good moves and all like, but at the end of the day, results are what matters. And I think when you're talking about the, the Dubasites and talk about that, like, I'm not even like 
as anti Dubis as a lot of people are, or whatever. No, but, I, like, I, but buddy, I think you and I have been in pretty yeah. much the same position as always, which is like he he got better over the years and he's a good GM. It's hard yeah. to call him a great one when his team's won one round. He's made some huge mistakes. He's made some good moves, but ultimately, yeah. like the ledger is in the negative for Kyle Dubas. It's hard if you're just a rationally thinking person to look at it and be like, so, wow, what an amazing job. The rational part of that is, is with people, the irrational part of that is, sorry, with people pushing back on this and the people that are still in the camp is what it comes down to, man, is it sucks to be wrong. It sucks to be wrong. And listen, we do sports talk radio every day. We do podcasts every day. I'm wrong a lot. And it sucks. It sucks to be wrong. And there's so many fans of this team that dug their feet in with him and where they thought he was the end all and be all. And his plan was going to work. And they built their whole identity around him as like their sort of galvanizing guy where it's like, we love Dubis. We're, you know, I'm a Dubis guy. You could almost like line it up with your political views. Like it's a, it's a Dubis fan base outside of the Leafs. It's a fight within the fan base. Mm -hmm. And now they all have to look at themselves in the mirror and say that the Dubis plan didn't work. But they the, won't. But I know, but that's, they know deep down. I think like, I don't know how, man, you could be sitting here having this conversation with any of your friends who are Dubis guys or like anyone. Where you're at the bar talking about Dubis' tenure and been like, you know what? I think he I think we should keep going with this. Like Dude, it's my over. favorite part of this it did not is that, work. Yeah. My favorite part is like you and I were in a group chat where one of our buddies literally replied, Whoever takes over if the Leafs win, Dubis isn't gonna That's get insane. any credit for his roster. No. It's like, dude, they have nine guys who are on the playoff roster this year that are unrestricted free agents. Yes. It's going to be a wholly different team. <laughs> like, yeah, it's, it's like, that's how far the disconnect is here on this stuff. You're right. Dubas brought, he was tied in so deeply with hope. He was tied in with a completely new generation of fans, like a young generation of fans that didn't want any part of the negativity of the years before, which is totally understandable, man. If I would have walked into Dubas at age 17, 18, yes. you know, as a hockey fan, I would have felt the same way that this is a beacon of change. This is going to be something different. You're walking in with the new players and ultimately it ended up in a place where you go, Oh man, uh, like the GM here, it didn't work out and people were at each other's throats and the guy gets fired. I I'll say this about is like, I missed the days where all the Leafs fans just all agreed to hate the GM. <laughs> that was like, <laughs> That, oh, the that, good old days. I'm talking about the passion that unites us. Like oh, John yeah. Ferguson Jr., oh, there was nobody man. that was like, you know, <laughs> the Cap really screwed him there. He had a tough yeah. call. <laughs> there was no JFJ defender. We were all just uh, in the same camp together. Anyway, yeah. I, I like we'll get into whether we think the the decision was the right one. I just like to close out the Shanahan part of this. I think that's the awkwardness of his media conference is that he's basically talking about how. He liked Dubas. He wanted Dubas to be the guy. He was offering him the extension, but then he watched him talk at the media conference and he got a little emotional and he moved on and decided that this wasn't the best case scenario anymore. But again, I, I understand it the way, at least I'm interpreting it, right? This is, this is like art, right? Nobody yeah. knows the right answer and we can talk about all this other stuff. The way I'm interpreting it was this guy looked at it and said, we can't give him everything he wants. And we certainly can't do it when he's publicly stating that he's not sure this is the job for him. And, and I get it. People talk about like family life and, you know, prioritizing these different things. Dubas was still negotiating like, and now that pretty clearly looks like a negotiation tactic that he used. Mm -hmm. And I hard think that not rubs, to, hard not to think that dude, he came right back and they discussed the offer a yeah. couple of days after the media conference, like they were negotiating on Wednesday and Dubas brought Bronny to the table. So it's like, you wanted more money and more power. So if you're going to have more power, that's more time away from your family. And next year was going to be more stress on your family. Like you, you could, you didn't do this for some virtuous reason. This wasn't like a guy that took a stand against the corporations and said, <laughs> no more being away from my family. Like he's going to work in hockey. He's like, again. he's like a live guy. He's like a live guy. He's like, Oh, I want to spend more time with my family. Not yeah. the billions of dollars in blood money. I was, Dude, I was just, it's funny that you say that though, because it's all about who the person is that says that quote, because yeah. We hear Ian Poulter say, this is just about setting up my family for generations. We're like, you scumbag Loser. liar. And then with <laughs> Dubas, they're like, we have to take it at face value that this is exactly what he's doing. Yeah. It's all about family. Yeah. Anyway, he made a negotiation tactic. He made a ploy. He played his cards that way. And 
he didn't get the contract extension. And now I have to at least wonder if Kyle Dubas is looking at this going, boy, I was the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And this is a guy who wanted to be Theo Epstein, right? Like he's a competitive, passionate guy who's from Ontario. I wonder if he's thinking to himself, I was in my mid thirties. I could have been making millions of dollars. I could have been the guy that brought a championship to Toronto. And now instead I'm a guy who's looking for a new job somewhere else where it's going to be just as hard to win. If not somewhere that might be harder. And if I do win where people will be like, who is the GM of that team in the vast majority of the hockey markets? I, I think this is an L for him. Like we'll see what he does with the rest of his career. But, and, and this is the part of it that I'm, I'm not ashamed to say at all. And that for some reason we've lost this a little bit in our sporting culture because every, like a lot of people are jaded now. I think you should give a real care about being the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Just like, I think you should really care about being a player of the Toronto Maple Leafs. And this is my thing about even some of these guys, if they're going to take haircuts and hometown discounts, I get it's easy for me to sit here and say like, take less money or whatever. Yeah. And I've brought this up before and you know, this being my good friend, I stayed in Toronto rather than taking a job inside of a different city once for less money Mm -hmm. because I loved being in Toronto and I wanted to be here and have everything. And those players just like have not learned that if they're going to be winners in a salary cap league, they're going to have to decide if, if, are they going to take a bit of a personal sacrifice when it comes to the money or are they going to get it all and make it harder to win? And so I just, I, I looked at Dubas and I thought, man, it was the same thing. You wanted everything and you didn't get the one thing. And you were the first guy, the first domino kind of telling the rest of the organization, like, this isn't the way we're going anymore with everybody. Yeah. Everybody just doesn't get everything they want just because they want it. And just because you've gotten out of a playoff round time for a new culture. hundred percent. And it's funny. You mentioned the negotiating thing. Our friend, Anthony Petrelli, did you see his tweet? No. That how ironic is it that Kyle Dubas's tenure ends because he misplayed a contract negotiation? It's yeah. Like, Oof. It's true. Ouch. That's a wake up call for you. Like, the apple it's... in the garden of Eden of Kyle Dubas. Okay. So let's move to that. Like, do you think Kyle Dubas still should have been GM? Because I've been wrestling with this for uh, like since the Leafs lost, going back and forth on it. And now I'm like, I think this is the right call. I do too. And I, I, if you had to ask me right after, I would have said immediately gone. No, you can't have him back. And then I cooled. It's funny. And I was then, the opposite. I, I cooled a little bit, you know, as time went by there. And then once that press conference, like that press conference, like, clearly MLSE and like clearly Brennan Shanahan had a bit of an effect on me. I, I don't know how you could sit there as a fan of a team who a guy who like was came straight out of the Sioux by Brandon Shanahan and got put into one of the most premier jobs in all of sports after, you know, being with the Marlies, he worked his way up. Don't get me wrong. He worked hard, but to get put in that position, they chose him over a hall of fame general manager. Mm Mm-hmm. I think for him to sit there and be like, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. Like how can that not affect the way a fan feels about him? Like, I don't know how someone who's a diehard fan of Kyle Dubas could have watched that press conference on Monday and still had the same faith that his heart was in this. This is a premier job in the world. There's 30 of these babies in the best at hockey league in the world. You had probably the most prestigious, like you said, where would it matter more as the general man? There's not one place it would win- matter more. I'm not sorry. North you can, America, not Dallas, not, the Cowboys. If you yeah. won with the Cowboys, that's it. And like, they've like, they've got a more recent. Yeah. But I still think that like the first guy to bring a Dallas Cowboys championship, it's that. But then yeah. right after that, it's the Toronto Maple Leafs. So then I think like that affected me. And I really, after that, and the more time that went by, I was like, what are, what are they doing here? Like either, you know, crap or get off the pot here, Kyle. Like what's, what's the holdup. And now that the details came out, that was the holdup. And I'm like, well, no, like you don't get to, you can't have your cake and eat it too here, man. Why do you deserve more money? Like what? Like I know they've had good regular seasons. They've set point records. Who uh, cares? Is there anything more infuriating Who than cares? people do that on Twitter where they're like, set multiple franchise like, records? It's like, so then bring back Babcock because he had yeah, the same argument yeah. at the time when he was I, fired. So I I just, I didn't think, like, I am completely fine with this, this decision. And mm-hmm. I do understand the fear of the unknown. 
Like I get that. And I think that's a lot of what people are upset about right now and scared about is like going into this big window and we can talk about the effect it has on Austin Matthews. And Mm -hmm. if, if Austin Matthews wants to be a Toronto Maple Leaf, it doesn't matter who the general manager is. He's going to get a big fat, he's going to get a big fat check. He's going to sign the big fat check and he's going to continue to be a Toronto Maple Leaf. If the general manager of the Toronto Maple Leaf matters to him about signing a contract, do you want him here anyway? Like that's we insane. Like for a guy who's a stud playing for the most popular team in the world being like, I don't know if I'm going to sign a hundred million dollar contract because the guy I kind of like not. Are you insane? Why would it matter? Why would it matter? Like, I, I, it's just, there's accountability finally with the Toronto Maple Leafs in terms of the general manager and probably the coach, because I don't think Keith's going to be back if he's not back. I, yeah, it's pretty I tough. Know. I honestly, How can I actually be, so, did be afraid of accountability, like accountability. Like there's finally accountability and everyone's terrified of it. I know that's that, but that's the thing is like, I was saying this before, and I think the last Leafs talk we did, which is I, I usually hate when we use the broad stroke thing of like, uh, participation award culture. Yeah. But it's like, this is the ultimate example of that where people just keep pointing to the regular season success. And it's like, that's why I kept asking that question. What, what is the bar? Like, what is the bar for you as a fan? Because you've got people now who are completely twisted up going, they've had these regular season wins and it's a crap shoot and Bobrovsky got hot. And you're like, yeah. you really watched those games and thought that's a team that was going to go to the next round and win cups. Yeah. Like you heard Shanahan even talk about it where he's going and all the winners say the same thing. Every single winner that has talked about winning Stanley cup says the same thing. They all say it. They go, it gets harder as you go along. Mm-hmm. Like, it doesn't get any easier. You don't get through a round and then all of a sudden, oh, finally, we beat Tampa. Now we're on to the next round. Yeah. It it gets harder every step of the way. And, and they got me, punched the, in the face by that. Literally. Uh, exactly. Exactly, dude. And for me, the thing with Dubas, why it was like they clearly had to move on or at least had to think about moving on. If you're Shanahan, you're looking at this reasonably and you're saying, how long can I draw out this negotiation publicly in this media market, but also as the Leafs, are heading into one of their most important off seasons yeah. ever. They've Can't got, wait. N- dude, they've got nine players that were unrestricted free agents. They've got the Matt Murray contract sitting on the books. They've got to move. They've got a restricted free agent, Nilia Samsonov. They have no move clauses kicking in July 1st for Matthews and for Marner. They've got to figure out what's going on with Nylander. They got to figure out what's going on with the coach. They got to figure out how much of their staff they're keeping ahead of the draft. Like, mm-hmm. What Kyle Dubas is the one who signed the contracts in Mitch Marner and Austin Matthews that had those hard deadlines for no move deals, even though, again, they were restricted free agents who got the max amount of money and the minimum essentially amount of term one day after they kick it after his his contract expires, by the way, exactly like it was so advantageous for Dubas to continue to drag out the negotiation and to have it continue to go to the point where the Leafs would have said. Well, we almost have to give it to this guy because no one else is going to be able to get up to speed in time. Mm -hmm. All this talk about, well, they couldn't let, why couldn't they let Kyle have a few more days when he wanted to make a decision? Because that's business. Because they had work to do. The work doesn't stop on his schedule. And again, him putting himself before that was very clear in terms of his priorities with the organization. And you know what? To me, like, I think it's fine that he did that. You tried to negotiate, man. Yeah. You tried to get what you thought was your best offer, but it didn't work out. And I'm not going to sit up here and pretend you're some hero because you lost a contract negotiation. Like, my God. Anyways. No, no that's... but you just, you touched on like, yeah, it, we can move on from that part. It's fine. You're right. Yeah. What you just well, said there is bang on. Well, I was going to say that clearly the next priority is the GM and there's been yeah. some names kicked around. It feels like right now, if you're going to do the front runners, it's probably Brandon Pridham. And then I would say it's probably Eric Tulski of the Carolina hurricanes. And well, I just, it feels so like gonna, what the, you're, you're going to hire Dubas from seven years ago. I, I know, man, it feels that way, but my guess is, is that Shanahan will try to pair him with some kind of overseer hockey type. And they go back to the Lou Lamorello ish model where they have yeah. an old guy in the room. I, I, and I'm just throwing out names here. I think Brad tree leaving is very much in the mix. I wish our guy, Mike feud because straight up that guy's a winner and he's from the area and he cares and he gets it. Oh, yeah. Like he's got the pedigree. He's found a million players. I don't know why he's not more in the mix for the job, Yeah, but, um, I think that they kind of need to have a hybrid model of people who can really work together. And that's what I'd be looking for if I was them. Like, hey, Britham or Tulski, you can take a real step forward in your career, but you've got to be able to play well with 
Shanahan and the other person they bring in there, whether that's a hockey man. Yeah, exactly. Another kind of hockey guy to balance things out. And frankly, someone who you think can pick up the phone call and maybe be doing some of these harder trades with Marner and with Nylander potentially over the next month and really figure out what's going to happen with the Matthews negotiation. Like, dude, I, I know this is kind of one that he wasn't exactly Mr. Popular by the time he left. And then he kind of went out with a curtain call, nice move with his big trade. But I actually wondered if they would give David Poyle a call and be like, Hey, will you, I thought you were going to say Mark Hunter. I was like, Oh my God. No, no, no. Come on. I'm not doing that. I'm not buddy. I'm not going to piss off the Dubasites that much. (laughs) Oh, you piss off the own sound faction of our show. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to think about names that could actually sit down with a like more junior kind of guy and be a part of a real new brain trust that works together and can find a way for a path forward. Because to me, it's just this is the this is the cool thing about right now is you really do have an opportunity to reshape the culture of yeah just putting up regular season stats and saying you want to be here but for the most money and no term it's just not it's just not going to no. cut it anymore fellas like we're we're here and we're about winning championships and you got to get back to that and it it's weird because that's actually what it kind of felt like at the beginning of all of this and then they just lost the plot basically from those contracts on and that's yeah. why like that was the I'm biggest about- with the Lou Babcock Shanahan thing, that was like the biggest thing was like, yeah. get rid of the blue and white disease. And like, you know, I know Berkey said that too, but like they were kind of bringing it on. And yeah. it was like that sort of accountability, super accountability. No one gets overpaid kind of thing. And then, yeah. and then it just, that crashed off the road. It went away. It went away the second those contracts happen. And yeah, it just, it all immediately became the player empowerment era for the Toronto Maple Leafs. And I said, if they would have given it to Dubas and they would have given him more power, I was like, these guys would basically just be going back and forth, handing each other contracts. And it really yeah. was the inmates running the asylum. Like I was talking about it today on my show, you just couldn't do it. And so whoever the next GM is, yeah, they're, the, the first priority is obviously going to be sit down with Austin Matthews and figure out what is mm-hmm. the future here. Yeah. What are the most important things to him? What's going to affect his contract negotiation? But yeah, you got to get that done within the next month. So pretty huge shoes to fill and a pretty monumental moment for this franchise because crossroads. Yeah. It's, it's a huge spot. And again, another reason why they couldn't wait. But when I look back on Kyle Dubas's career, here's, here's what I think a guy who made great, good, not great. Good, not great. Like here's, here's really how I feel. I think he got better by the end of his job and he really Mm -hmm. did start to change himself which is actually another thing that's so funny about the people that made like the identity politics about Dubas. It was like, yeah, man, he actually went all in on heart at the deadline and completely reshaped the team for that exact purpose. Mm -hmm. And so he was clearly not the same guy who came in here. He was always trying to be a a hockey man. He said that from the beginning that he was never just like a numbers guy. Mm -hmm. Um, He made some really like good moves. He did. I thought that, you look back at this deadline, even though Jake McCabe didn't really work out for them as well as they had hoped in the playoffs, like getting him and Sam Lafferty for that deal was like, it's a pretty good trade. Love getting Shen. Gold, getting Luke Shen for a third round pick, good trade. They got out of the first round this year, like good move. They mm-hmm. won a lot of regular season games. He was he was really solid at identifying certain guys like Michael Bunting, who came in here and played on the cheap, right? David Camp, another guy who he found, came in here, played on the cheap, brought in TJ Brody, right? Like, made some good moves. I think the Jake Muzzin trade was really good. I think that the extension was really bad, but then you look at things on a whole and you go, he brought in Matt Murray. Mm. He, he gave Peter Morazic. Goaltending is a big time death nail for him. He gave Peter Morazic a three-year contract extension. He traded Nazem Kadri for one year of a defenseman that has bounced around ever since and basically been told over and over and over again, like you can't win with him in Tyson Berry and a center who was the whipping boy and then eventually ended up not being a center here in Alex Kerfoot. Like he signed all those guys to contract extensions that we can all say the cap would have gone up. Every single person at the time thought that that was more, they were kind of record setting deals. He let Nylander sit out half a season over a contract fight when he was an early GM, he signed John Tavares. Now it's funny because people wanted to give him credit for that. And now people are looking at it and it's like, well, now you got to say it well, wasn't so hot. I think it's his best and worst move. Yeah, it's it's funny because it's a weird one to discuss. But like he has traded a lot of picks away and some of them you can blame on Lou and the bad deals he had to get off of. But some of them you can also blame on picks because he had misses like 
Nick Ritchie. Like <sighs> the, the Leafs are not stocked up with a bunch of draft picks or a bunch of awesome young players that are going to be coming up. They basically have Matthew Nyes and something potentially in Joe Wall that were under his watch. Like he ended up firing a coach that ends up going to end up being two coaches. He got one playoff round done. Like where, where am I? You know, he gave Jake Muzzin that extension and then he wouldn't broach asking Jake Muzzin to waive his no move during this last off season where or, he gets hurt and has to go up and move on, assets for him. Or what? put on him on LTIR last deadline. Yeah, or put him on last games. deadline. Like, I, I'm sorry, but like he traded a first round pick for Nick Felino, who got uh, hurt. I know, I hate playing the result on that because I loved it so much. I'm, but I'm not even saying these things to be like, hey, these are all bad. I'm just, I'm lining out all of the like major moves he made yeah. during his tenure here. It's like, how could you tell me that that lineup of moves was like amazing? I think actually that his best move that might end up aging the, the best is the, the questioning, which was the Morgan Riley contract after yeah. this last playoffs. You're looking at that going, huh, I feel differently if, about this. If there's one contract to me that, you know, will if there's one move that will stick out to me, it's not getting Matthews for the full eight years. I know like, it really that, is that, that one to me, like, I know there's tons of moves that people will talk about and you can talk about Marner, but you know, Marner earns his money in the regular season. That contract's completely fine. Now with the player that he's become in the regular season, you could talk about his postseason stuff, but I think not giving Matthews everything mm -hmm. on the AAV, but mm -hmm. only getting him for five will always, because now they've set him up where he's going to be the highest paid player in the NHL. And he probably doesn't deserve to be right. Yeah. Like it's, it's really, that one is to me, the one that will always stick out to me and his moves that really put this franchise in a bad spot. And like, you can talk about Tavares, but at the time it was a great signing and everyone was fired up about it, myself included. And it just hasn't worked out. But like mm -hmm. the Matthews one was a real, real concerning bad one to me. And there was a window with Tavares where he was the man. Yes. And he like, was awesome. He, he was awesome for three years. Yeah, he was. And so you, it, 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 I don't want to say it's quite like this, but it does remind me a little bit of the Russell Martin contract where you knew that the whole yeah. deal wasn't going to be great, but the first few years of it were Maybe incredible. Maybe the Springer and, one too. Yeah. Well, that oh, one, boy. you'd like oh, a little boy. bit more on the front end than uh, uh, so uh, far. Uh, um, but <laughs> I just, I, there's never been a case for me that I've seen from Kyle Dubas other than people going, he won all these regular season games. And it's yeah. like, yeah, but the team he inherited was always going to do He signed that. great like, guys for 750K, which he has done, but it's like, which one of them had a big playoff moment? Yeah, I like, it's a fair one, man. Year over year, and he kept churning those guys out, and yeah, none of them ended up yeah. saying, by the way, and that's even that's another part one of we it. didn't mention. What? Letting Hyman go. Yeah. Ooh. Or should we stop here? Like, I feel like we're just going to keep going. Letting Hyman go over five and a half million to keep Kerfoot and pay bunting. It's like, oh boy. Buddy, what, let, not protecting Jared McCann and instead deciding to go nope. with yeah, Justin Hall. Hall. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm not saying these things to railroad the guy. I'm saying these things because it's like, that is the body of work here. Like, that is where we're here. When people what? talk about the players letting him down, I, dude, no one thinks that the Leafs biggest issue has not been their young core four guys delivering mm -hmm. in the most important moments. But if you're going to evaluate Kyle Dubas fairly and his tenure here, like it was a failure, everybody like yes. he won one playoff five seasons for God's sakes. Like it didn't he work. owns some complicity in this. Yep. And that was always the weirdness about giving him the extension to me and why I kept wrestling with it is I went, I think this guy is a good GM. And I think he has gotten better at it over the last five years. Cause who doesn't get better at their job yeah. over five years. But yeah. at the end of the day, it felt so weird to reward a guy with more money, more term, more power, give him everything he wanted and set the stage for the exact same thing that had just happened yeah. based on the results they'd gotten. It was just, it was too strange. This, and this has to be a wake spot. This has to be a wake up call to everyone, mm -hmm. to Matthews, to Marner, to Nylander, to anybody on this roster who's under contract for next season. They're like, Oh baby. This is not the same. We're not going in. Like our pillows maybe have taken from us here. Like mm -hmm. how could they, all these guys are like, we love being Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, no crap. Because you get to play for the the most popular team in the league. You never, you have to face the media for three minutes a day. Never ask any questions. Get to, you know, just have the best life ever. Never lose your job. Never get traded. Never like really, you know, it's pressure, whatever. But like, no accountability. How could you not love being here? Buddy, I, 
People talk about the media here like it's so hard. Someone genuinely asked one of the players, what are you most proud of this year during the exit interview? Yeah, the last like, question. I was like, oh, my oh, God. Imagine yeah. having to deal with that. Like, like imagine, you know? you got, you, imagine you asked that question in a New York Yankee scrum. Marley yeah. Rivera might have to say yeah. something to you if you asked hey, that. Aaron Judge, <laughs> like, you lost again in the playoffs. What are you most proud of this year? Yeah, and no. it's just, no, man. No, it's I think so today, overstated. I, I think today is a scary day for a lot of Leaf fans. But I think mm -hmm. if you're feeling that way, you could also look at it as an exciting day. It's sure. it's it's a different, it's a new time here. And it's yep. a crossroads. And listen, I think Matthew signs on July 1st, regardless of who's in charge. So I we gotta go here. We gotta only gotta get a couple minutes left. But yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's it's a it's a different day. Times they are a changing, my friend. It's pretty clear that Matthews is now the number one priority. And again, they mm -hmm. need to meet with him and figure it out. But it's like, it's not like Brendan Shanahan can't meet with him and also start to work on this contract, like that he and Brandon Pridham can't start to have these first meetings with him. But you're right. It's like, first of all, the thing with Matthews has always kind of seemingly stayed the same, which is that, yeah, he set up the five years because he wants the most money. And so it really does come down to them talking him into what the money is that he's going to take because he looks like he'll take another five-year deal so he yeah. can end up redoing this. Yeah. And yeah, three. As, as frustrated as you might be with Austin Matthews, you can't just let players like that walk and you have to at least make a pretty concerted effort to get it done. But you're right. If he was, if he was really trying, like he was really trying to say he's going to leave the Toronto Maple Leafs if Kyle Dubas wasn't GM, right, bye. then goodbye, man. Yeah. Like, then you really never got it in the first no, place. So exactly. see you later. Enjoy yeah. whatever market you're going yeah. to. All right. This was Leafs Talk. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at JD Bunkus, at Sam A. McKee. You can listen to my podcast at JD Bunkus Podcast and uh, the uh, Real Kipper and Born. So subscribe to both of those. And yeah, hit the thumbs up on YouTube and then leave a review five stars if you can. We appreciate you watching. We appreciate listening. And we can't wait for the next couple of weeks to see what the hell happens here. Because, yeah, this is now past succession in terms of most interesting oh, yeah. show behind the scenes. Uh, I don't it. know about that. I don't know about that. Season eight, episode eight of season four, maybe the greatest episode of television I've ever watched. Yeah, so it'd be, be tough to top this. All right, buddy. Good. My pleasure. Enjoy your long weekend. See you, Tom.